The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everyone to today's Association for Manufacturing Excellence webinar titled How Lean Can Reach Its Potential, the first in a series of three webinars. I am Jerry Strohmeyer, the Education and Training Program Coordinator for AME, and I will be your moderator. Today's presenters are Robert Doc Hall, Monique DeMay, and Jack Ward. Doc Hall is the chairman of the Compression Institute and a 37-year veteran of Lean. He is a co-founder of AME and was the editor of Target Magazine for 22 years. Doc is the author of two books, Compression and Zero Inventories. Monique Domey is the Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and Kaizen Promotion Officer at Simmons Bedding. She has over 25 years in quality, technical, manufacturing, and engineering in several industries, including plastics, aerospace, food, and electronics, for both military and commercial markets. Jack Ward is the Vice President of the Compression Institute. He has an extensive executive experience with Melville Corporation and as a turnaround executive for several other companies. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. You will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. You will see that you are muted on your attendee panel on the right side of your screen. If you have questions during the webinar, Please type them into your question area on the attendee panel and click on Submit. We will review the questions at the end of today's presentation and answer as many as we can. When you log off today, please check your email inbox and it will be an invitation to fill out a link to a short webinar attendee survey. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey today as your feedback is very important to us to improve future webinars. Our presenters have also graciously agreed to provide a PDF of today's presentation. We will be sending that along with a recorded link for a webinar replay to each of you next week. Now, I am pleased to introduce Doc Hall, Monique DeMay, and Jack Ward, who will present how Lean can reach its potential. Take it away, Monique. Thank you, Jerry Ann. Well, welcome everyone to our webinar, How Lean Can Reach Its Potential. In this first part of a three-part series, we'll discuss why Lean has not reached its potential. We'll start with a brief history of Toyota, their lean journey, including how they started, and it wasn't always in automotive. Then we'll talk about why some North American companies have struggled with lean and its benefits. Now, there are other companies in Japan that have been very successful embracing lean, and it's evident in their business philosophy and practices. Doc will talk about one company that has been quite successful in taking lean to its potential. And then to close out the webinar, we will introduce compression thinking and how to introduce lean and how to get it to its potential in your organization. This part of the presentation will also have a preview of webinar number two. Now the webinars in February and March will go into more detail on how lean can reach its potential, so please come back. Just one more housekeeping note, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation so please refrain from questions until after the presentation is complete. Thank you. So I'm going to start off by asking both Doc and Jack, why has Lean not reached its potential? Doc, Jack? Well, this is Jack Ward. Um, I'm the co-founder of uh, Compression Institute and a past executive director of AME. Um, over the last 35 years, Lean has created its own identity in the U.S. market. And that identity is kind of based on the fact of quick fixing a lot of quality problems that uh, had arisen in production. The bad part of it is the fact that, from my experience, is the fact that many of the U.S. Um, management teams have not challenged themselves to rethink or, or transform themselves. They have looked at the uh, various aspects of uh, lean as simply tools and, in many instances, cost tools. Now, I can't say that they haven't had some success, but the reality is they haven't had the success that's implied in the system of lean as it goes out. 
our experience, both Doc and I, uh, we've been asking this question of how can lean reach its potential, and also why hasn't it? And Doc has a perspective being part of the original group that had joined with the Japanese in terms of defining the uh, TPS system. Uh, he is has been involved with what we now called in the 90s lean since the, the middle of the 70s. I've been involved with more the end of doing transformations of companies uh, and bringing companies on board for mergers and acquisitions. And I've used a lot of the techniques of lean, but from the management point of view, particularly value streaming and making it a whole system and looking at it as a system. I have found that that has produced a lot of good results. But it's important to know that we are here sitting in the United States in the western area of the world have used lean more to fit in with our fixed beliefs on what management should be and how we should manage organizations. And this may be one of the major difficulties. I think Doc can give us a kind of an introduction to both lean in the 1990s and pre-1990 lean systems that Toyota had to develop. Doc, why don't you give us a some of the slides now. Yeah, I will start with a little history of lean and about a little bit of my own history with it. Actually, I never heard anything about whatever it was called in the 70s until oh, 76, 77. I was teaching a course in materials management for MBAs, and four Japanese wanted to audit the course. They heard about MRP and related software, didn't know anything about it, wanted to come to the U.S. and learn, and they didn't want to hear about it from, from salespeople at software companies, so they came. Two were from Toyota suppliers. One was a prof who worked with Toyota, and, and he really became my sensei for many years. Uh, I took them on plant tours, asked them what they did, thought they were full of it at first, and they invited me to Japan, and I didn't get there till the summer of 79. Went back again anywhere from one to three, four weeks, about every summer for around 20 years thereafter, and I've, I've been back a few times since. Uh, during that time, I would ask the older ones, how did this start? never got really great answers because it was kind of fuzzy in their mind how this started. So let's just roll through a little bit of history. <clears throat> Toyota began in the loom business with Sakichi Toyota. That's the family name, not Toyota. And he was an inventor. Uh, a guy a little like Henry Ford, except he wasn't as self-promoting as, as, as Henry was. And he wanted to get every yen or dollar he could get in the company and reinvest. He, he, he wanted to make his dream of the perfect loom of that time come true. And by 1905 or 6, he had one that drew world attention because it was automated and it would stop when a thread broke. So from the get-go, he had the idea of fail-saving a process, and they'd use that in their plant some, too. And since he was trying to save all the cash he could, scrap and rework were wastes, and inventory were wastes. I'm on slide two. They're all numbered, and I'll call numbers as you go so you can keep track. Uh, it was Kichiro's son, uh, or, or, or Sakichi's son, Kichiro, that really had the bug to go into the auto business. And that was late 20s. They tinkered around with cars for several years, finally started building something in 1936. When you look at the real record, they weren't doing much. They, between 36 and 42, they only built 1,700 vehicles in total, and most of them were trucks. And so this was an incredibly small thing. They didn't know much about vehicles, and they were having to learn that, and they were having to learn 
a different kind of production that used a lot more material per unit than a loom did. And so while they had been maybe world class for the time in looms, by the way, they're still in looms. Uh, just just Google the uh, Toyota textile machinery, I think it is, and that's the company today. But then uh, they were struggling, and so was all the Japanese auto industry with auto production. Total volume consumption in Japan sales were 50, 55,000 a year, and half of those in the 30s were knockdown kits from the U.S. Most of what they actually built were trucks and buses because that's what they really needed. Uh, a lot of roads weren't passable by cars anyway, and so it was it was a real struggle to begin. As World War II progressed, uh, they went into war production. They built trucks, but they built so few that their plants weren't bombed. We never made they never even made it on our bombing schedule. But a lot of the rest of Japan did, and the destruction. Uh, unless you were kind of there and saw pictures or something, the destruction is hard to imagine. At the end of the war, Japan was utterly devastated, so bad that they feared revolts, that people would starve to death. Uh, MacArthur had his hands full with the occupation of Japan. It took years just to clear rubble. The phone system didn't work. The radio stations didn't work. Bridges were destroyed. This was real ground up, learn from the basics kind of stuff, beginning after World War II and continuing. Uh, Toyota really had a problem in 49, 50, when a financial crisis hit all Japan. They had a, a big problem over that. All the companies did, and Toyota in particular, the banks forced Toyota to lay off people and cut pay. I remember with Sakichi, his philosophy really was to depend on people, and that continued. And at that point, the Toyota family, the ones running the company then, realized that they had to embody that philosophy in a practice that they built from scratch. There wasn't any book by, to go by to do it. You can see from the pictures in the 50s that whatever they were doing for lean then doesn't show very much in the picture. It was neat, but that's about it. And the Toyota way was a half century from being written down. They really had a hard time explaining what they were doing. <coughs> the bottom line of all that is they had to, to get into the auto business and learn to do much better and used very little because they didn't have anything to work with. In essence, they were trying to build something quality and only had junk. And you think about quality for a minute. They were trying to build a car like this, the, the 47 Toyota Path, with tools and equipment that were barely process capable. It's why they began to take up with SPS. It's why they regarded quality as job one because uh, it may be why they had real trouble problems with volume production on an assembly line if the parts don't fit you're done if you got to stop and, and fiddle with a part to make it go it won't happen Henry Ford figured that out much earlier with a Model T he spent a lot of extra on precision tooling when the parts snapped together it was just a matter of time until they had assembly lines and we tend to forget that aspect of manufacturing history today, and Toyota's only assets at the time were old equipment and human ingenuity, and that began the adventures of Taiichi Ono. I regard Ono as sort of like uh, General Patton to General Eisenhower. He was the he was a crusty shop guy, and they knew something had to be done. And he was he was and some people around him were the people to do it make something happen. And they had to get all the people of Toyota involved in making it better. And so they, in terms of technique, 
all the companies in Japan were then into quality circles in the 50s. Quality circles, uh, the beginning is best PC, the simplification of the tools and the things that quality circles could use. Uh, they, they were deep into TWI, training within industries, which we had forgotten about. Uh, and everybody was doing that. But what were they really doing? And today it's called the Toyota Way. And they had a hard time explaining it to me or to almost anybody, even in Japanese, when I talked to translators, they didn't dig it either. And this was 79.80. Create a system that includes the people that runs itself. And by that time, they had progressed enough that they were, were trying to have quality that would capture global market. And I remember that that uh, slogan on the wall several times cars to love the world over. That told everybody what they were trying to do. So if you summarize this, why did it begin late? And why did it go well? Well, first it fit the, 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 the owners, the founding family's philosophy. Second, quality was number one. No point improving the productivity or, or taking the waste out if the quality is, is compromised. And then they were in a small area of Japan, about the size of a U.S. county. They were isolated from other people. They were motivated because Japan depended on getting into the auto industry just to earn yen to buy food, amongst other things. So their friends, their neighbors, their country depended on it. The company formally was organized somewhat like an American one, but actually it ran more like a military organization. And I saw several suppliers of Toyota in, say, 1980-81 that wore uniforms or were somewhat military and even had insignias of rank. And so the HR system and, and the pay system was much more like the military than what we'd think of in a company today. And it was a set of relationships in a small area. All the leaders, the managers, sort of knew everybody else, and they just did it. They were engineers. They were production people. They weren't finance people. And so they did what made sense to them just looking at it. As one old fellow that I interviewed very late, the year 2000, he'd been there. He'd been one of Ono's fair-haired boys. He didn't know quite how it came about, said they just tried this and tried that until they got something that engaged all the employees in making it better. And if something didn't work, they went on to something else. And, and the set of techniques just came out the way it did. Could have come out some other way. That was an integrative innovation. There are antecedents for almost every technique. But putting the whole picture together was their innovation. And nobody else in Japan quite did anything that complete. A couple of the uh, couple of Toyota suppliers were very close, and they they developed along with them. But that took a long time, like 25 years from roughly 1950 until all the suppliers were lean in 1975, and they were then pushing to sell into the particularly the American market. They they didn't have money to automate. And so you had to eliminate the waste, make it very simple. And the prize of that was an old plant called Camigo Number no. 9, an engine plant. I saw it several times. I remember one lady that was touring that that looked down at the equipment and said, isn't that cute? Because they had these real simple limit switches and old equipment, and you pushed a, a, an engine block into one end of this, and you just kind of clinkety clinkety down through the machine, sort of like, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And then you looked at what they had accomplished. That plant in engines produced was five times more productive than equivalent American engine plants of the time. They had really done a, a, a real number because they simply thought about it all differently. They didn't automate. They took the waste out. They were different because all manufacturers did TQM, but only Toyota integrated TPS. And by the late 70s, they were instructing a lot of other companies. Everybody else was trying to emulate them. 
And my role in Japan early on was to talk about MRP or ERP as it was then, and software, a lot of which I've kind of forgotten. And and the Japanese companies were trying to figure this out with software help. And the conclusion we generally reached was, yes, it might help a little bit if it leads to something that's a material change, meaning you can't turn a rowboat into a racing yacht by putting by making it controllable by software. You got to change the rowboat. And so you went back to the Toyota way. What were they really doing? Well, it was a system they had a hard time understanding. Uh, factors that block us in North America. You think about that. What's different? You can put a hundred things down, but the company is usually seen as an asset of the ownership, and the people may be seen that way also. The managers got to know more than if they're a manager, they got to know a lot more than other people. And because of that, if you change ownership or even change management, and you have a lean program going, they can just destroy it pretty quickly. And I bet most of you on the call have either experienced that or you know a company that has. There's a great struggle because it's not recognized as a major change of the company. It's, it's something grafted on. And so the HR practices may not accord with it. The accounting doesn't go along with it. By the way, Toyota's old account, it was so simple that anything would have fit it. There was no mystery there. Uh, suppliers or logistics or uh, all kinds of things that would tend to support the system don't get changed. And I refer to that sometimes as mechanical lean. What happens all too often is we adopt the techniques and they work pretty well. And occasionally we pull off the workers into Kaizen, but almost nothing else changes, and the problem solving does not become a daily thing. I know my sensei and I toured several American plants, say early 80s, up to the early 90s, that late. And his comment always was, it does not reach the management, it does not reach the real leadership, it is consigned to being a staff program. So other things, uh, managing by results. So this is pushing to make a financial target. And that may continue even if we use KPIs, you know, set KPI targets and, and drive people to it. No confidence that if you just develop the people, the targets will come. Uh, it doesn't, the learning distance don't become habitual. Uh, we will start calling the the, the counter uh, the counter of that a vigorous learning organization, but that's one in which learning disciplines become habitual, and the real objective of the managers is to create this system, including the people that virtually runs the company on its own. Their job is to create and to sustain the system. And last, it doesn't guide much of a vision of a company beyond just improving efficiency. Sometimes a, a, an American management will just say it's a, it's a good way to reduce your costs and don't see any more than that. Don't think enough about effectiveness, not just efficiency. How to make clean reaches potential given all that. There's too much copying at Toyota, or has been, and every company is there. Today we have lean in healthcare and IT and agile software and various derivatives, and I have a hard time sometimes keeping up with the buzzwords that somebody's invented. But go beyond the basics that came from Toyota and ask some deep questions. Number one, what's waste freely? Is it what the customer wouldn't pay for if they if they knew about it, that's the stock uh, lean definition. But suppose the customer pays for it. And sometimes they will. They may even pay extra for it. 
Well, then you don't need any of the lean stuff. So think of it differently. Even in a fairly practical way for Kaizen, it's taking a process that we think is necessary and reducing it to a lower energy level. That is, reduce the space, reduce the travel distances, reduce the travel uh, or the time, reduce the inventory, and uh, most of all, reduce the scrap of the rework and get a better result out of using less, and that's a lower energy state. Uh, it says there, what's productivity? But a good question is, is your productivity effective, or are you improving productivity just to make a bigger mess someplace else that isn't really effective? Everybody's favorite example is is a, a phone center, you know, so you telephone some company for assistance and what kind of a run around the rigor road do you get and if they are monitoring their their phone assistance uh, on the basis of productivity how much of your time do they waste and so that that leads to another question is the company effective serving customers, not just efficient. Think a bigger system. Is it effective? What does effectivity of a bigger system mean? And then question the assumptions of business, question the assumptions of lean, ask your, ask your own questions and say, how do we become better than that old uh, uh, approach of, of, of just looking at a narrow part of the process to making it better. One thing Lean did accomplish for a lot of companies is that thinking of a value stream gives you perspective on a much bigger process than just thinking if you improve each workstation and add up all those efficiencies, then surely the whole thing is efficient. And of course, anybody that's in Lean knows the fallacy of that one. But there are still people that just don't see that. Uh, Kind of think about that, and I'm going to describe at least one of the best companies I've ever seen. And there were two Target articles on it over the years. One early 90s, another one was, I don't know, four or five years ago. And Seiki Sui Housing Division, Seiki Sui Chemical Company, they do a little work in the United States, but they are probably the leading manufacturer of residential housing in Japan today. And the reason they're so good is they're excellent in more ways than lean. I think the title on each of the articles was Three Day House. <clears throat> but last I knew of them, uh, they were moving into service. They thought of the business as service, not making houses. That's a part of it. Adapt the house to what the customer needs over time. Of course, you've got to be able to afford that. But try to do that. Uh, solar panel roofs, pretty much standard, uh, zero from grid house. Uh, one house is a part of a neighborhood, sports planning by uh, of neighborhoods when you can. Is the house going to fit the neighborhood, that kind of stuff. Uh, by the way, the, that picture is from their advertising. And I saw very few yards in Japan that looked that green. A good many of them, you didn't know anything, you just kind of swept the dirt instead of mowing the lawn. What grabs lean people is that 80% of the physical work is done in three days. Maybe a sig more significant than that is about as many hours go into planning and new houses or changes working with the customer as go into executing the physical work after that's done. In other words, get the plan right before you build. That saves a lot of trouble. The house is remarkable. It's steel frame. It's precise. Built like an automobile. They test modules from time to time. They practically guarantee you that this house structure will stay intact up to in an earthquake until the ground practically melts out from underneath of it, but the house will still be there. Uh, they're big on recycling. They can recycle today at least 70% of 
a house of their own house if they take it down, and it, it'll be a little less if they're taking down somebody else's house. The total time that for the house to be built is 40 days, and about 10 days of that is slack time they throw in because they're waiting on some government inspection to come look at it. That isn't much different in Japan from where it is anywhere else. And they're leading edge in materials research. They're part of a chemical company that does a lot of research in building materials. So they are kind of a test bed for what might be better. And they are certainly a leading edge company in design for the environment. These pictures have appeared in Target. There's the welding fixture. There are 92 different modules of that fixture. I think there are two, and they will adapt to any size module pretty quickly. Welded up like a car body. Uh, precision, 20-some uh, years ago, they were still having trouble with the precision. Uh, persuading, for instance, a supplier of wood that we do not want more than, let's say, one millimeter deviation in about an eight-foot run. And the supplier would say, what? But you do that and things fit just like with a car. And so you look at that assembly line, uh, it worked like a charm. It was like watching a ballet at times. And there are drawings behind the lines. You see maybe one little sheet of paper hanging there, but there's not much. The drawings are behind the lines. The material handlers and the assemblers all just look at the drawing, and they seem to know what to do. Not much kanban as we think of it. It's to feed the stuff to the line that's necessary for that module and put it in place. And, and for all the stuff that we you know, the, the speed at which those went together, you didn't see a whole lot of activity and not a lot of wasted motion. When the modules are done, they're loaded on trucks, as you can see, taken to the housing site. That may take another day. And then they are erected on site in one day, and the thing is sealed off from the weather, and all the rest of the work can happen after that with a house on site. If they can ship to the site overnight, then you have a two-day house, but they don't advertise that. But what really does that? What creates the system that can do that kind of thing? Uh, Lifetime employment ended in Japan and most companies a long time ago. They couldn't guarantee that anymore. And young people will walk if they don't like the company or like the boss. And that's they can find another job. And this was a pretty disciplined process. So very early on, every new employee has to be engaged in Seiki Sui's improvement process. It's much like Toyota, but it's, it's their form of it. I didn't ask too many questions about exactly what that was, but uh, very important to them. And the second part, very important to them, is that all employees within a year or so should be able to interpret a drawing with pretty good facility. And once they're accomplished at it, any employee should be able to talk to a customer about their house using only the drawing. And you don't see much paper in the company except the drawing. No matter what job you have at the moment, if you're, say, the receptionist where customers come in to look at stuff, you should be able to talk to somebody about their house using the drawing. To get people to that state, mentoring is very important to the senior executives. I know when I talked with them, they, they were complaining that after the end of lifetime employment, they had to pay a lot more attention to mentoring because they were trying to attract people that really like to do this kind of thing, and then put them in a, in a system that was so interesting to them, they just loved the work. You know, if you've got people that will come to work because they like it, even if they weren't paid, that's great. Of course, they do need to be paid because everybody in the industrial economy needs some money. But that's the ideal. Uh, That was Seiki Sui. Uh, this is a lean maturity index. I think it goes beyond lean, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. So on this index, where would you put Toyota? Where would you put Seiki Sui? 
say it takes a minute to kind of gaze at this. The big black line is, you say it's leadership of a major transformation to get from the proficient level up to vigorous. Most of the lean companies in the U.S. that are doing okay are proficient. That is, you just look at process improvement, you look at the lower left-hand quadrant, the core operations flow, but the staff still coaching tools, and maybe they're coaching and maybe they're re-coaching. And the process never seems to end. They can't break through from that and go on. If you go to the innovation category and are proficient, You've probably done some leaning out of a new product development process, may use 3P, may you know, engage uh, a variety of stakeholders in, in consultation on, at, at, the, at the conceptual stage of a product. So you wind up with something that doesn't need a lot of redesign or that's difficult to make or difficult to serve in the field and all those things. And they're doing well. Uh, they have pretty good cost, quality, and delivery. And by today's standard, they're pretty good corporate citizens, at least in their community. That's a pretty good company. So how do you go beyond that one? The vigorous level, and you know, by the way, you look at the columns, much of the time when we think lean, we're only looking at column one, process improvement. And so the vigorous level in that chiefly is that problem solving is a part of the daily system. It becomes habitual. It's the way people think. And you're not waiting on too many Kaizen's. You may en engage in them from time to time, but it's not a it's not an occasional thing where people got to be sort of re-educated. It happens all the time, and there is a methodology for taking the ideas and and, and putting them into practice that just goes. Uh, go across to innovation. The company is a technology leader, if possible. Think manufacturing company. Uh, usually they're good because they know something or they can do something that other people can't. They've carved a little niche for themselves. By the way, the Japanese today don't necessarily think that much about Toyota, and especially say one like a Sony. The companies they really watch are the small and medium ones that have acquired a technology that is impossible or very difficult for others to do, and they have carved out, behold, a global market of sorts doing something special. But just as important as anticipating new customer needs. Tech, if you can get ahead of the customer and you can resolve issues to them that maybe they don't know about or can't know about, you've got something going for you and they, the customer may not know it, but you are taking care of them in ways that, that are kind of beyond them. Uh, if you go to the uh, third area, that's uh, extended responsibility. And that one is uh, beginning to think about all of the stakeholders, serve all the stakeholders, and think of the company as its stakeholders. It's no longer a set of assets under one financial heading. That's a very limiting idea because, as we say, everybody knows that a company, if, it, if you think competition, it competes by doing something better, and it's the employees, and it's the suppliers, and it's maybe the local junior colleges or a bunch of others around the company that makes it really work that way. And then what happens if you begin to think of the environment as a stakeholder? That really changes thinking. What do you do to serve all the stakeholders and to think of the company as people and as all its stakeholders, what's well, top level enduring? At that point, good enough that they eliminate waste daily and routinely, something that's a new process gets 
whipped into shape pretty quickly. So in other words, they learn very fast. And they're good enough at it that they can change and greatly modify business models as they go along. Seiki Sui was getting that way now. It took Seiki Sui a long time. It's not magic. They've been at this 25 years. But their business model is pretty pliable. Uh, I don't know what their what their specific mission is in words, but it's obvious to create housing that fits the customer at any stage of life. Their innovation, uh, the new offerings that you come out with are effective and they're born lean. So don't use any more than you have to. And it's a very effective solution all the way around. This is tough to do. If you just go back to the plant analogy with, say, a Seiki Sui or even a Toyota with multiple uh, models of cars on one line, it's coming out with a complicated end product that, it from, that emerges from a relatively simple system. That's real genius. Uh, trying to do that and coming up with a terribly complicated system is not real genius. They think it's genius because we did something that was really messy to do, but real genius is keeping it simple and coming out with something that meets the customer's needs and now for, for, for a long time in the future. And then under extended responsibility, make that a mission. The mission. You asked me to come in and, and uh, give you yeah. a, a time check. So here it is. Yeah. Time check. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're close to the end. So that last upper quadrant, take on the mission to uh, to make other people's processes or processes outside the company better. And that can be any kind of process. We'll talk about that in future webinars. But the real big difference is not always what you do inside the company, but what is your effectiveness helping your customers and others outside the company? Get a bigger picture. In part, that's been done by Seiki Sui. So after all that, where would I put Toyota and Seiki Sui? Well, Toyota is sort of in the vigorous level. They're pretty good in process improvement daily. Technology leaders, sometimes are they a lot better than other car companies? Eh, not really. And they have been fairly good at anticipating new customer needs. They're not really enduring because they have promised to change the basic business model for some years, and they've struggled and can't really do it. They have not been able to make the change from selling vehicles to being in the business of personal transportation as a service. They thought they might be in 2004. I, I saw where Fujio Cho, the chairman at that time, or president at that time, had made that promise. It didn't happen. And, and they do some things environmentally that are pretty good, but they're at about the same trap as every other car company. How much better are they than any other car company today? Well, maybe a little, but people could certainly argue the point. They've not continued to do something that distinguished themselves. And the Toyota critics in Japan, the old hands, will, will simply flat out tell you that. Uh, Seiki Sui, edging into the enduring category. They certainly have the mission in mind. They might not talk about it much, but they have it in mind. So where are we going from here? Uh, maybe between now and next webinar, think about your company. And go beyond Toyota ask some of the deep questions. These are the same questions we had on a prior slide. What is waste in your company? What's productivity or more exactly, what's the purpose of productivity? Where do you need to be productive? And where is it maybe not so important? 
Thanks, thank you, Sue, for a minute. Very productive building the house. Productivity is less of an issue if you're helping the customer design a house. Now you're thinking about effective. Or take a real simple example. Uh, let's say you're you're reading a bedtime story to one of your children. What's productive about that? Well, not even an appropriate measurement. It's just something you sort of need to do. Why worry about the productivity? Or tell me, how do you improve the productivity of a kindergarten? Wrong question. What's the effectiveness of the kindergarten? And so on and so forth. Um, and if you think about your company, is it effective serving customers and not just efficient? Maybe have we even thought about all the customers, put them in the category of stakeholders. How effective are you with your stakeholders? And then in your case, what, what would effectiveness mean? And last, don't stop asking questions. The five whys we think actually began with Sakichi Toyota. Expand that into about a hundred whys and more, including the assumptions of lean. What are its assumptions? Would those still hold? How do we really become a lot better than mechanical lean? And we'll begin to address that in the next webinars. <coughs> the next one we call 21st Century Lean Business Transformation. And we'll talk more about compression thinking. In fact, I, I think we'll talk about it as, as more as uh, emphasizing quality over quantity than in many other ways. You can think about it many ways, but why compression? Well, the world and all of its resources are finite. At some point, not far off, we're going to have to figure out how do we live pretty well and use a lot less stuff doing it. If you're in manufacturing, that's a different kind of challenge from what we've had here to pull it. It's huge. Um, and then a second part of that is how do you consider a lot more, a lot faster making decisions? If you're thinking about all the stakeholders and, and you, you've got to rattle all this around, how do you do that? It may be easier than you think. Uh, it's the reason. Difficult explaining something less is why the old senseis had so much trouble trying to explain to a Midwest Yahoo like me what they were doing because they, they couldn't talk about it. Their contention would be, you, you can't talk about it, you've got to live it. And so words are a little difficult for this. And it begins to get more specific if we just ask pragmatically, how can we live better using much, much less? It simplifies an awful lot of other mess. Our third webinar is on vigorous learning or vigorous learning organizations. And a little more technique in this, how can we get from here to there, uh, making all decisions large and small, considering more factors. And, and we've taken some cues from some of the best lean companies and best learning companies seen and say, what did they do? What's effective? And maybe how could we get from here to there? Uh, well, I can blither on, but let's shut up and take questions. OK, thank you. And uh, now we'll, we're ready to review any questions. And if you do have any questions, please submit them on the right side of your screen, and I'll read them. And actually, Doc, if you could go back to slide uh, 18, please. 18, that, that's... Yes, that's the... Mater the material index, had. okay. Yeah. Right, right. And the question is, if a company is in the bottom left and was able to devote some resources or effort to initially improve one direction, do you, rec do you recommend they increase breadth? or depth? Well, a little of both. But uh, I think it's best addressed by thinking about 
effectiveness, not just efficiency. And I'm not quite sure what's meant by breadth versus depth because you get it. I never know what to say in a company until you kind of see it and say, are you doing pretty good now you need to, to expand your lean or or what. Uh, and what to do, uh, you kind of think in techniques. Think about what change in management attitude will make a difference so you set your own direction with this. What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? What's effective? And that begins to give you your own answer. And I'm not sure, sitting way remote, that I could begin to approach that. Uh, got sort of like the old senseis I was around a few times. Uh, they're not going to give you a real quick answer unless you say, what can we do to make something more efficient? And you narrow the question. As long as it's broad, then what do we have to do to give ourselves a different idea of what we do now and what we need to become. And I think that will answer your own question, is it depth or breadth? OK, great. Wasn't much of an answer, but at least I can make a response. <laughs> OK. Uh, the next one is, if Japanese culture focuses on the group and looks at long-term commitments and payback, and if American culture is strong on individually looking for instant gratification, either personally or personally and commercially, then how does this impact the potential of lean, and how can we improve this? I'll take a stab at it. Yes, American business and Americans in general are very short-term oriented, and it's it's bad enough that it has become a huge problem to them and to us, uh, trying to just grow, grow, grow without thinking about why is rapidly becoming a big mistake. And it's the way we, it's what we think success is. And success isn't how big, how much bigger we can become. Success is how much better we can become. So nothing particularly wrong with growing, but why? And what are you doing to make the, your customer, your world, a better place by so doing? Just capturing market share doesn't do it. Now, short term bit, that goes down to, say, the quarterly reports to Wall Street and all those kinds of things. Almost all executives today hate those except the, maybe the Wall Street analysts themselves. And so the problems with those are, have become well known when they're extreme. But we're still not really good at leaning back and saying, what do we want to be in 10 years or 20 years or 30? How will things change and what can we do? Our normal reaction is, God, everything's changing so fast. If we project two or three years out, that's all we can do. And my thought looking at somebody's product is to say, what happens to that at the end of life? Uh, depending on what it is, will it still be functional in 10 years? 20, 30, 100, and it's it's changing the nature of the questions that's pretty important. And I don't pretend that that's going to be an easy thing to do. You got to figure out how to get from under, out from under that short-term financial pressure by either Wall Street or banks or creditors or somebody. Okay. This is Jack. I think. We, we kind of focus in on the myth of the Japanese culture being so di different from ours. But let's take other Western cultures. How about Germany? It survived the same kind of problem, and it took quality versus quantity as their management style and business model. In the United States, we're kind of facing a problem of too much production, a lot of competition, so growth cannot be made solely as your formula for success. 
even in the short term. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have to not only look at Japan, we should be looking at some of the northern European countries in their success coming out of a disaster. Um, this, this index really is, I think the black line on it is very important. The question before was proficiency, which direction you should you go? Well, the black line says you're going nowhere unless you challenge management to take on the transformation of the, their company model and take the leadership, not the supervision, of people as their goals. And I think they have to start looking at lean as a system that can give them success and competitiveness. So those are just two quick points. I know we're getting short on time. Yeah, I've, I've been in some truly awful Japanese companies. They don't do lean because they're Japanese, that's for sure. And uh, they were awful back when, and a few of them remained awful. And I knew at least two Americans that went to Japan to show Japanese companies how to do TPS, not automatic with the culture. Although they are more groupy, they would go for quality circles more automatically than Americans would, but but it's not that big a difference. How about Unilever, Jock? The what? How about Unilever as a company? I really don't know much about them, so maybe you can. I think they've been a very successful company in terms of quality and, and this matrix itself. Great. You know, we've got like three more questions, so let me just try and get them in before the time runs out, OK? Go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts regarding tracking cost savings ROI to substantiate the value of a company's lean systems? Does this help or hurt lean in reaching its potential? It hurts. Uh, and I think so, but you get into this thing, are you chasing the money or are you trying to figure out what you're really trying to do? If you went back to the Toyota example, they were their, their accounting system was almost as crude as old Henry Ford's. If he had more money in the bank at the end of the month than he had at the beginning, he figured everything else was okay. Because you could kind of see that everything else was going all right just looking. And so if your objective is to make more money, you're not trading your sights on becoming more effective. Now, everybody has to make money, so it's, it's not like that's totally unimportant, and certainly you don't want to lose money and go out of business. But one way to think about it is making money is a spec, like an engineering spec, on a process that we really think is important, a, a higher mission. OK, thanks. Another one is, can you name a few of the most lean advanced companies in the US? Uh, there are some showcases, uh, and in recent years, I've, I've picked uh, three or four that seem to stand out, and they're well known. One was uh, almost everybody's favorite, in some way, is AutoLeave. And AutoLeave was a little different because uh, uh, some retired wing, uh, TPS execs from Japan came and lived with their top management for like three years. They got mentoring at the top. So that was a different transformation from trying the techniques at the bottom and then the top management was trying to see if this is going OK. And so that's a more complete transformation. It's a good one, I think, to learn from. Then uh, Tana Medical Systems is pretty good. And they're good in more ways than lean. So that's part of safety suit. So there, there's a lot more to the story than what we usually conceptualize as mechanical lean. Uh, who else? Well, I'm out of gas for the moment, but those are a couple. OK, great. And it looks like our last question now. Why don't business schools embrace a lean curriculum? <laughs> 
Well, I was in a business school for 32 years, and I can tell you that I was the fly in the ointment for the most of that time. And it's because business schools, it, they will teach something about it. They may have a, a lean curriculum, but most of the MBAs that I had, I taught for working sticks, evening classes. And I'd say about half of every MBA class was, let's say, the average age was 30, 35, somewhere in there. They were engineers or other technical people. They were getting beat up by their financial people and their accountants, and they wanted to learn something about business and self-defense. And so uh, some of them would come out, you know, very good people. But that's still, I think, why people go to a business school. The, the, the bias goes both ways. It's what people want when they go in, and it's what the schools feel obligated to put out. And so uh, this, is, this is a bottomless pit. You know, I, I remember the young finance profs whose great am, greatest ambition was to design a derivatives package that some big Wall Street firm would adopt, and thereby they'd make a name for themselves. I'm not sure what that contributes to anything, actually. But uh, they were incapable of comprehending what I was talking about if I tried to explain lean to them. It, it didn't register. So big business schools today may have a program on lean, but the, the financial bias is still very much there. Uh, they've moved more towards entrepreneurship, so there's a big movement there, but that, that's a different story. That, that, that's the bottom of this pit, I think, again, to discuss. But it's sort of there, but it's uh, kind of like leaning companies, you know. It's, it's kind of off in the backwater in the operations department someplace. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for that, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Doc, Monique, and Jack, for a very insightful presentation. This brings our webinar to a close. Our next webinar, which is the second webinar in this series of three webinars, is scheduled for February 11th, titled 21st Century Lean Business Transformation Compression Thinking. And the third webinar in this series is scheduled for March 4th. Please visit AME.org under AME Events and Training for more information and to register. And don't forget to fill out the short survey that will be in your inbox. Thank you everyone for attending and have a productive day.